So our goal is to live a regrets-free life, right? Right? Regrets-free. So that's why we're working on this particular series of messages. We're in Proverbs. Go there with me, Proverbs chapter 3. And we welcome those at Pound that are joining us for the message as well this morning. And now we're going to talk about living a no-regrets life. We're going to go on to, I think it's number 4 here. You saw many of the regrets on the screen had to do with financial things. Well, we're going to talk about money today. How many of you have regrets? Let me, let me say that different. How many of you have financial regrets? Financial regrets? Wished you wouldn't have, wished you could have. I think we all are in that boat. That's what we're going to talk about. So Proverbs 3, 1 to 2. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. You love that, right? Pros do you love the word prosperity? Do you want to prosper? Let me say, Pastor, I want to prosper. If you don't want to prosper, you can go home right now, because this message is all about prospering, how to prosper. So if you want to prosper, then stay tuned. There's more to come. We're going to talk about it. And you know what? All the keys, because we're talking about how to live from Proverbs 3, 1 and 2, what? How to live a prolonged life, a longer life, how to live a peace-filled life, because the New King James Version translates it for length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. So we want to live a longer life, a more peace-filled life. Are you liking that? Peace-filled? Or are you like living in turmoil and stress? Fear, anxiety. Don't you love that stuff? No, we want to be free of that stuff. So a longer, who wants to live a longer life if it's just more anxiety? So you got to have the peace-filled part in there too, right? A more peace-filled life, then a longer life, and then a prosperous life. More prosperous than I otherwise would be without the wisdom of God. So we're gaining wisdom from God's Word to see those things happen. And there's several passages, as I've been reading through the book of Proverbs in my morning devotion times. And uh, in fact, that's why Proverbs 8, I'm going to read that in just a moment. But just listen to words of wisdom here from Proverbs. Proverbs 4, 5 and 6 says, get wisdom. I'm trying to give you wisdom so you can do just what that verse says. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or swerve from them. Do not forsake wisdom. Tell your neighbor right now, don't forsake wisdom. That is God's word. Do not forsake wisdom. How many people know the right thing to do and do something stupid anyway? That's forgetting wisdom. <laughs> Don't do it. Do not forget wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. It's good, isn't it? How about Proverbs 8.10? Choose my instruction instead of silver. Knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies and nothing you desire can compare with her. Wisdom outshines all the real estate you can buy, all the silver you can accumulate, all the gold you can shove in your safety deposit box. Wisdom outshines all of them. Proverbs 8, this is the one from, from, from last week for me. Uh, verse number 17, wisdom says, I love those who love me and those who seek me find me. You know, doesn't the book of James have a promise about that? If any man lacks wisdom, ask of God, and God will give it to you liberally and not withhold from you. So he says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me find me. With me are riches and honor, enduring wealth and prosperity. My fruit is better than fine gold. What I yield surpasses choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness along the paths of justice, bestowing wealth on those who love me and making their treasures full. Whoa. Now, doesn't that make you want wisdom? And more wisdom, we can get it, never get enough. And even you old bucks here with the silver hair can never get enough wisdom, right? So pray this prayer with me. Bow your heads with me. Pray this prayer with me. Jesus, by the power of your Spirit, fill me with wisdom today. 
I choose to seek wisdom over silver and gold. So today, begin to give me a better life, a longer life, a more peace-filled life, a more prosperous life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's do it. We've gone through several keys already. The first was to tie love and faithfulness around our neck. That was Proverbs chapter 3, I believe, verse number 3. Second, build Christ-like boundaries in our lives. Thirdly, lean hard on God's wisdom before you make any decisions. And by that, we talked last Sunday about asking the right questions. Don't ignore, reject, or deny the right answers. And establish the right guardrails. So how many of you did your homework? How many of you established some guardrails in your life? Put up your hand if you did your homework. If you didn't do your homework, your assignment is to go back on the website, listen to last Sunday's message again, and do your homework. If you want wisdom more than silver or gold, you'll do it. If you don't care, you won't. Don't be lazy. Follow God's word. Wisdom will fill you, and the benefits of that wisdom are going to fill you. Today, we'll go to the fourth one. The fourth is honor the Lord with your wealth. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. So we have two areas in our life that it seems are most prone to regret. Anybody take a guess at what they are? Uh, maybe the number one, possibly, arguably, the number one area where we're more prone to regret is financially. The second area where we're very prone to regret is sexually in our life, and we'll get to that one later. But today we're going to talk about many, uh, money. So how many of you have had a financial challenge? Had a financial challenge? Uh, how many of you have had financial regrets? I think all of us can lift our hands to that. So let's try, let's try really, really hard to remember or try to imagine we're in financial trouble. You say, well, Pastor, you hit that one on the nose. I'm there right now. <laughs> try to imagine with me you're in financial trouble. And here's the question I have for you. Where are you going to go for help? Who are you going to talk to? Where are you going to get advice from? You're in financial trouble. Who are you going to go talk to? So let me ask you a couple of questions. Number one, would you go to a friend who can't keep a nickel in his pocket? Would you go to him for financial advice? No. How about somebody who's, had ba who's filed bankruptcy three times? Would you go to them for financial help? No. How about somebody who you know is a thief? Would you go to them for financial help? No. So how about somebody that has successfully grown a business and has made, helped other people make millions of dollars? Would you go to that person for help? Now, some of you might recognize this guy. I got a picture of a guy maybe some of you know about. He's pretty well known around the United States, Dave Ramsey. Uh, I'm not here to advocate Dave Ramsey, but I can tell you that this is a man who <clears throat> in 1988 filed bankruptcy. He, he, when he was in his 20s, his older 20s, he owned $4 million worth of real estate. His dad was into real estate. He followed his dad. He became very, very financially successful. Uh, and then... Uh, in the middle 1980s, he became a Christian, gave his life to Christ, was following God with his life. But in 1988, things happened in our economy. He had to sell a bunch of real estate. He had a million dollars worth of debt. And he ended up filing bankruptcy, was totally broke in 1988. Being a Christian, he began to search the word of God for answers as to what to do because he wasn't sure what to do. He began to find principles in God's word to help him to, you know, build wealth once again and get his financial life back together. Today, this is his new house. Did you show his new house yet? This is Dave Ramsey's new house. As you can say, see, he's been sort of successful 
in what he's done. But, but here's the cool thing is he credits the Lord with helping him build that wealth and success. Would you go to this guy for financial advice? I, I probably would. Looks like he knows what he's doing, right? But that's not the guy we're going to go to. We're going to go to somebody else for financial advice today. The guy we're going to go to, uh, let's see, what's his credentials? Number one, he was a prominent national leader, uh, personal, personally managed one of the world's greatest construction projects, 153,000 laborers. I don't know how many people work for you if you own a business, but he had 153,000 laborers under him at a cost of somewhere around, in today's number, $4 billion for the project. He led his nation into the greatest era of international power, its greatest era. Yeah, his personal wealth drew worldwide visitors to come to try to gain wisdom and teaching from him. He authored books on many different subjects from science to politics uh, to marriage and philosophy. But maybe the top thing is that this man, Solomon, received a divine gift of wisdom from God. And he wants to share it with you. How many of you want to hear what God has to say about your finances? Yeah. He had a divine wisdom from God. So we're going to look at Solomon's, seven, Solomon's six secrets to financial prosperity. Six secrets to successful finances. All right? Now, now, this is not an exhaustive list. You can go into Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and find more than what I'm going to give you. But these are six things, practical things, that we can look at and do today. Six things. Number one. Number one. Remember, you own nothing. You say, well, I got this title. Well, that's nice. And you'll have it till you die, and when you die, you'll leave it behind. And in the end, you came into this world with nothing, and you leave this world with nothing. And the reality is, God's Word teaches us, and you need to you need to get this into your head, in your mind. In reality, you own nothing. All of us are simply stewards of this land that God created, and it all belongs to him. All of us are but stewards of all the stuff he gives us. But in the end, we give it all back, and it all belongs to God who created it. 1 Timothy 6, 7. Paul said, For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain, it's certain we can carry nothing out. Absolutely certain. Uh, Psalm 50 verse 10 says, For every animal of the forest is mine. God is obviously speaking. Every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills, they're mine. And God goes on to say, For the world is mine and all that is in it. So the reality is you don't own it. You're just borrowing it. You're a steward of it. God has given you the opportunity to manage it or whatever for this time that you're on earth. But it was all his in the beginning, and it'll all be his when you're gone. So what are you going to do to recognize that position and show gratitude for the privilege of borrowing it for this time while you're on earth? What are you going to do to show God your gratitude for the things and the blessings he's given you. What are you going to do to say thank you to God? And what are you going to do to control your sense of greed? Because we all have this little thing called greed going on inside of us. It's this little four-letter word, more. No matter how much we get, we want more. Ecclesiastes 5.10, whoever loves money never has money enough. And it doesn't matter if the whole world knows your name and if you're at the top of the billionaires list, because now we've got lots of billionaires in America too. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. So what do we do with that little four-letter word that's always bugging us and we're always wanting more? We look at our neighbor and they bought something, so now we want it. We didn't want it before, but now they got it, so now we want it. This other person got a new vehicle, so now all of a sudden, we got to have it too. Recognize that that's that little thing called greed inside of you that keeps screaming at you, 
and says more, more, more. What's the answer to that? Well, Solomon's answer to it was this. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits. First fruits. Let's put that in practical terms. So <clears throat> this isn't obviously the gardening season right now, but when the gardening season does eventually roll around, your first basket of fruits, Solomon would say, give it to the Lord. It's your way of, of doing several things. It's your way of telling the Lord, thank you for providing this for me. Number two, it's your way of saying, I'm going to give this to you, believing you're going to provide and continue to provide for me the rest of whatever I need for this. And it's your way of saying, I'm not, it's your way of dealing with that thing called greed. It says, I'm not going to take it all to myself. I'm going to give some and bless the Lord and honor the Lord with my wealth. Now, that means when you harvest the field, the first truckload goes to the Lord. That means when you get your paycheck, the first 10% goes to the Lord. You say, well, why am I doing that? I'm doing it because I don't own any of it. I don't get to take it with me when I leave this world. It's been given me to, from God, and I'm to be a good steward of it, to say thank you to the Lord. Just to say thank you for his provision in my life, I'm giving this to you, the first fruits I'm giving to you first. To say thank you. To show God that I trust you to provide for the rest of what I need. I'm giving this to you, number two. And number three, to deal with that little thing, that little four-letter word called more inside of us and say, no, this isn't all about me and all for me. Lord, destroy that greed that's inside of me. I'm going to give it to the Lord. Here's the question that everybody here has asked themselves about money in their wealth. Here's the question we've all asked ourselves. How could I have ever been so dumb? Why did I buy that thing? Why did I invest in that? Why did I use my money for that? Am I right? Is it true? We've all regretted some things we've done in our life. Our first mistake, though, is when we fail to set priorities for our, our money, our wealth. The first mistake, Solomon said, is when you fail to set a priority for all of your money, all of your wealth. And he said the number one priority is honor the Lord with your wealth. Solomon's words, and when you do, he'll bless you with more because he knows he can trust you with more. Number two, uh, here's Dave Ramsey's advice on this. <clears throat> you need a plan. You need a written plan. Proverbs 21.5, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. So what is a budget? And I like this. This is actually a quote from Dave Ramsey again. Uh, he, can you read that? A budget is telling your money where to go instead of you wondering where it went. It's a good thing, and every one of us need it. And let me just tell you on the back a counter back there, the Welcome Center, there's, a, there's, I put some free budgets back there. It doesn't cost you a thing. Just pick one up, take one home with you, and you'll be on your way to greater prosperity in your life if you don't have one. When it comes to money, wisdom says to fail to plan is to plan to fail. If you don't have a plan, then you're, you're planning to fail is the, the simple part of it. Larry Burkett has passed away now, but Larry Burkett was a Christian financial advisor uh, a man that uh, I just loved and drank up all the advice he had to give. And he said we actually need two plans with a budget. We need a long-range plan and we need a short-range plan. The short-range plan, obviously, our budget is something you do for your daily needs, for your food, for your clothing, for your heat, <laughs> For your emergencies, for your vacation, you need a daily plan for all of those things in your life. And it's just simple. Here's my income. Here's my expenses. It's got to come out to zero at least at the bottom. A plan, a long-range plan, it has to do with your home because that's such a huge investment. Buying your home, which is where you're going to live in the future probably. Planning for your retirement. 
Uh, and I think it has to do with investments that you make in your life. Without, your plan, without a plan, three things are sure to happen. At least three things, I should say. Without a good plan, without a budget, these three bad things are going to happen in your life. Number one, your anxiety level is going to be higher. Number two, your conflicts in your home and marriage are going to be higher. And number three, the possibility for future regrets has just skyrocketed up in your life. All three of those things are coming if you don't have a plan and budget to deal with. See, most of us don't have an income problem. We have a spending problem. And the only way to contain the spending problem is with a budget that confines you and makes you accountable to the plan you made as to what you're going to do with your money. So before you get it, you make a plan for what you're going to do with it so you're not wondering where it went at the end of the year. Make a plan and live a no-regrets life. Uh, number three, number three, work harder and smarter. Or some would say work smarter and harder. I don't care which way you look at it. And uh, I like this little comic. That's work smarter and harder. I like this one. Some of us maybe find ourselves in that position. We're in such a hurry. We just don't have time to work smarter. Knucklehead. <clears throat> the caveman should teach you something. Proverbs 24, 33, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. So in these verses, Solomon tells us a story. He said he was out for a walk, obviously in the country, and he came along this field in this vineyard, and he noticed that the, that the place was full of thorns and weeds. And the fence was torn down. The owner wasn't taking care of the field, wasn't taking care of his crops, wasn't taking care of his vineyard that were there, wasn't even taking care of his fence. And it was a mess. And I guess the idea is that the owner must have been in the house taking a nap. Or maybe he's in the house watching CNN. Or maybe he's in the bar telling bad jokes. He's somewhere instead of where he needed to be, which was working and taking care of the land that God had given him to take care of. And whether it's, a, whether it's land if you're a farmer, whether it's business if you're a businessman, whatever it might be for you, whatever the labor work might be, listen, Solomon is telling us that poverty is going to come knocking at your door. In fact, poverty is going to knock your door down if you're a person of laziness. But normally, we think of laziness as a physical problem. Laziness is not, first of all, a physical problem. Laziness is, first of all, a spiritual problem. So why is it a spiritual problem? Well, it's simple, Colossians chapter 3. Laziness is a spiritual matter because ultimately, none of us is working for ourselves. Working is serving the Lord. We're His representatives. In fact, Paul is speaking to slaves even and telling them what you do for your master is not for your master primarily. And first of all, your work is for the Lord. Work is for the Lord. Keep in mind when you do your job, I'm not working for the man. You know, country western, the country western community loves this idea, you know, blue-collar workers are working for the man, and they despise the man, which is their boss, of course. Despising the man, the boss, and I got to go to work for the boss on Monday, and, and hating that whole thing. No, when you're Christian, that's all wiped out. That's all deleted. Number one, who am I working for? You're not getting this. Number one, who am I working for? The Lord, when you go to work, if you're going to work tomorrow morning, bear in mind as you go, you're not doing this for the man. You're doing this for the Lord. Proverbs 3, 23, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Did, did anybody get that? Raise your hand if you got it. Okay, then I won't repeat it. <laughs> Verse 24, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward... Why would he reward us for doing this? It is the Lord Christ you are serving. 
Why would he reward us for doing this? It's because he wants good representatives out there. We're his representatives, right? We're his ambassadors. He wants us representing him well. And the way we represent him well to the world is when we're hardworking people. We're diligent people. We make plans. We're smart. Some are smarter than others. But that doesn't matter. We're doing the best we can with what we've got, right? And that's what he wants from his ambassadors. So work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord. You know, if you go to work despising your boss, it doesn't just hurt you. It doesn't just hurt your work ethic. But it hurts the kingdom. Because if you're known as a Christian... Now, this is what they're going to say Christians are like because of you. Be a good ambassador. Work for the Lord. Work harder and smarter. Number four, easy come, easy go. The easier your money comes, the less you appreciate it. The faster you spend it, the more you waste it. Easy come, easy go. This is a picture of Vin Baker. Anybody remember Vin Baker? Uh, Vin Baker is an NBA player, obviously for the Bucks. In his 10 years of playing, anybody have any idea how much money he made? $100 million. One, put your, put, put your mind around how many zeros that is. I mean, you're never going to see that many zeros in your bank account. No. I doubt. $100 million, 13 seasons he played. Ten years later, he was broke. Bankrupt. You say, how in the world? He was looking for a job with Starbucks because he was broke after making $100 million. What did I tell you? We don't have spending. We don't have income problems. Most of us don't have income problems. We have spending problems. Sports Illustrated says 60% of former NBA players are broke in five years. Uh, and you know who, are, who, who get broke the, the, the fastest? It's, they say it's the long-range, low-percentage, three-point shooters are the worst. Whether it's because they like to take risks or whatever it might be, but they have the biggest problems with finances too. Isn't that interesting? 78% of former NFL players face bankruptcy or financial stress in two years after retiring. Two years. 78% according to Sports Illustrated. Uh, Mike Tyson, you recognize this guy? Mike Tyson. Uh, several years ago, a professional boxer. In his boxing career, he made, uh, he made four times more money than Vin made. He made $400 million. He was broke before he retired. Uh, did you know 70% of lottery winners end up in bankruptcy? You you that want to win the lottery, it's the worst thing that could ever happen to you. Why? Because easy come, easy go. Uh, This picture here, this is a guy named Billy Bob Harrell. Billy Bob is in Texas, lived in Texas. He won the Texas lottery. He won $31 million. How many of you think you could live on that? The rest of your life, could you live on $31 million the rest of your life? I think I could. Uh, Well... Here's what happened to Billy. Interesting thing about Billy, and the reason I picked him is he was a Pentecostal preacher. Billy Bob, in two years, lost everything. Bankrupt in two years. Uh, Not only bankrupt, but committed suicide after that. Did the lottery win his... Ruin his life. What ruined his life was easy come, easy go. Too fast, too much, can't handle it. How about this guy? This is Buddy Post. Buddy won $16.2 million in the lottery. And uh, his girlfriend, of course, wanted a chunk of it, so she sued him for it. I'm sure that was a fun time. And uh, she got a chunk of his money, believe it or not. 
His brother wanted a chunk of it, so his brother hired somebody to kill him. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is they didn't get him for whatever reason. He survived that one. And then the rest of his siblings convinced him into making bad investments. When Buddy died, he was, mil he was $1 million in debt. So, Proverbs 13, 11, dishonest money dwindles away, but he who gathers money little by little makes it grow. Little by little. I want those words to penetrate your mind and be engraved in your memory. Little by little. Little by little. <laughs> little by little. Are you getting this? Focus on slow and steady. It's the turtle in the hair. And it works. Solomon said it works. Focus on slow and steady. Larry Burkett said this. He said, and this is what I live by. This is what I do in my life. He said, the first 10% you make, you give it to the Lord and you honor the Lord with your wealth, 10%. The second 10% you make, you give it to yourself and you put it in your savings account to help you prepare for things, daily things that can come up in the, and help you prepare for the future. And you learn to live on the rest. And when you learn to manage the rest well, because that's the key. It forces you into a plan. It forces you into a budget. It forces you into managing the money that God is giving you with. And when it all comes down to the end, you'll discover that little by little, you end up in prosperity. Number five, learn to say no. Learn to say no. Proverbs 17, 1, better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. So if, I, if, if, if you were to put a price on what your marriage and family is worth, what would you say your marriage and family is worth? $100,000? Is your marriage and family worth $500,000? Is it worth a million dollars? How much is your marriage? I want you to think about it. How much is your marriage and family worth to you? How much, if you put a price tag on it, what's it worth to you? Everything. You can't put a price tag on it, right? Right? Is that right? You can't put a price tag on it? And the truth is, every one of you have. Everybody's put a price tag on it. And your kids know it. And your wife knows it. Or your husband knows it. Because the amount of time you actually spend with them is what tells them how much they're worth to you. So that's why Solomon said, listen, let me just put this, let me paraphrase what he said just a little bit. Uh, you say, but pastor, I want a nicer house. I want a nicer car. I got to work more, longer to get that. I want a new snowmobile. Or I want this new thing or that new thing. Here's what Solomon, here's Solomon's words in my paraphrase. Better an old car and a happy family than a new car and you're fighting over the financial stress and anxiety you have in your life. Solomon's words, not mine. Do what you want with them. But I suggest you to take his words to heart. The last one, number six, avoid slavery at all costs. Now, immediately you're all in agreement with this one, right? Avoid, well, of course, avoid slavery at all costs. Proverbs 22, 7, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is servant to the lender. Let me just put that in a little different term. The borrower is slave to the lender. So the idea here is we need to reduce or eliminate the use of credit and debt, especially primarily for things in your life that depreciate. How many things in this world depreciate? Most of them. There's only a few things that appreciate, and some of those sometimes depreciate. But generally, real estate, a home, generally they say it was something that will appreciate in your life. A business has the potential to appreciate in your life, right? Some investments have an ability to appreciate. The one thing that certainly has an ability to appreciate is an education, giving yourself the ability to make more through education, through working smarter, not just harder. Did you know the average college graduate, the average college graduate makes $1 million more in their lifetime than the average non-graduate? It's just a fact, statistic. 
In 2018, the average personal debt, not including their mortgage, their home, because that's an appreciating item, we said, the average person was $38,000 in debt. Uh, and that number went up $1,000 from the year before, 2017. The average credit card debt was $16,000, which means you've maxed out quite a few of them to get to that number, right? Because don't they have a maximum with a credit card? So you've got credit cards dangling on threads. Uh, did you know that when you pay credit card interest, it's over 20%? And some of them are well over 20%. Did you know that $5,000 of continuing line of credit of credit or debt in your credit card is costing you more than $50 a month, just $5,000. And I said the average credit card debt is sixteen. dollars so you do the math of how much you are giving away to credit card companies. It's no wonder credit card companies, those companies are booming. They're making all kinds of money. You know where it's coming from? People's pockets that are paying that interest because they have debt with their credit card. Now, that's nothing. If you go to a cash advance store, you can pay over 400% interest. You say, you're crazy. How can anybody pay it? Well, if you've gone there, go home and read the small print. And there are many people today paying over 400% interest because they had to have the cash now. The whole thing is I got to have it now. I need it now. Am I right? I need it now. That's what's going on. The personal debt in the United States of America goes up $1,000 every second. Ching, 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 ching. 56% of divorces are caused by financial tensions. 30% of families have less than $1, even $1,000 saved for their car breaking down or their whatever. Um, buy today with no cash down, I want you to know, is in my mind, is a trap. It's a trap to get you into credit and debt. <laughs> Certainly not to get you out of it. Yeah. But here's what it does to you. Credit pushes the Lord out of his place as your provider for a couple of reasons. Number one, because you're not praying about that thing you want to buy first and saying, Lord, do you want me to have this thing? And number two, because you're saying, I got to have it now, and I'm not willing to wait for the Lord to provide it the way he wants to provide it to me. You're pushing the Lord out of your finances, and it encourages spontaneous decisions instead of asking God and waiting on the Lord. You are a slave to your lender. Avoid slavery at all costs. So there you go. Solomon's six secrets. Remember, you own nothing. Nothing. Make a written plan, work harder and smarter, come e easy, come easy, go, learn when to say no, avoid slavery at all costs. This morning, Lord, we just thank you for the great provision we have, and we in this beautiful, prosperous nation of the United States of America, among the whole world, we are some of the wealthiest people in the whole world. And I know a lot of people here probably don't feel real wealthy, but the truth is, if we could go to the third world and see how most of the population of this world lives, we would come home and kiss the ground that we live on and recognize that we are blessed by God in the United States of America. This morning, if you're willing to say, I'm willing to let the Lord choose my level of prosperity, I want you just to make it, I want you to just to, to recognize that by standing to your feet if you say i'm willing to let the lord choose my financial prosperity i'm not going to force it one way or the other i'm and you say i'm choosing today to honor the lord with my wealth now this is a big one do you say i'm willing to choose today to honor the lord with my wealth because that was the fourth point today i want you to stand to your feet if you say i'm willing to transfer ownership of everything i have to him and recognize nothing belongs to me it all belongs to him i want you to stand to your feet and stay standing to your feet if you say i'm ready to follow god's secrets to financial success and trust him with my finances then i want you to stand to your feet too just with eyes closed this morning recognizing this morning the awesome wisdom we've been given by solomon today to help us 
And God is helping us through Solomon to be more prosperous than we would, we would otherwise be without him. He's helping us and giving us direction. This morning as we sing this closing song, Only King Forever, our God's a firm foundation. He's the only solid ground. We can trust the name of the Lord our God with our money, with our wealth, with our finances. He knows what's best for us. He knows what, how is the best way for us to live and what to do with that wealth and finances he's given us. This morning as we sing this song, would you again just take and give it all to him? Say, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I depend on you. Lord, I'm going to follow you. Lord, I've learned some keys today, some wisdom today. In the beginning of this message, we prayed and we said, God, give me wisdom from heaven. And God's given you wisdom from his word today. We sing this closing song this morning. I, I want it to be a prayer that rises up in your heart and recognize, God, I, I've got some greed issues here. I've got some giving issues here. I've got some thanksgiving issues here in my life. This morning, I'm saying I'm giving it all to you and I'm ready to follow your wisdom for my life.